Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you guys had a good lunch. So, so my talk is about uh, manipulating XML, JSON, and SQL data types with Ballerina. So, when I, you know, first heard that I was selected to do this uh, talk, I was kind of delighted because for me this is like one of the killer features of uh, Ballerina language. All right, so let's begin with the story. So I just, you know, thought, uh, thought of, you know, coming up with a story instead of, you know, going through each and every data type and then, you know, explaining its features. So this story is actually based on my uh, experience. So I just, uh, you know, thought of uh, coming up with a story to, to, to explain the, you know, features related to data types using this story. So. So the story is uh, based on some uh, fictional company called uh, Data Dump INC. So it's just a fictional company I just came up with. So in this uh, company, you have James. He's the CEO of uh, Data Dump INC. And there's a developer called William. He's, you know, sort of a conservative guy. But at the same time, he's uh, working hard. And there's another developer called Henry, same as William. But he's sort of an open-minded guy. And you know he's sort of working smart, right? So let's move on. So James, CEO of the Data Dump company, wants his developers to develop a REST service that exposes employee data of his company as a service. And at the same time, he also wants the resource representation to be XML. So let's look at each developer's approach to solve this problem. So let's start with uh, William who is our conservative developer. So, so William is a big fan of Java. I'm, I'm also a big fan of Java. So he's chose, he, he has chose Java to you know, implement this requirement. So as soon as you decide on using Java, what you have to do is you have to come up with some JAXRS implementation, because this service need to be, rest, need to be a RESTful service. So there are like you know, many JAXRS implementations. You can you know, choose whatever you want. So once that is done, he has to decide on a suitable XML library because this service you know, has to send back a response in XML format. So since Java does not have any inbuilt uh, uh, support for XML, you have to come up with some third party libraries. So there are like quite a few third party libraries. Uh, so you can select a whatever you want. And then the other thing is uh, when you, you know, take third party libraries, there can be different licenses related to this third party library. So you have to figure out the best one that suits for your uh, production deployment. So once that is done, William actually can, you know, start uh, con concentrating on his uh, actual requirements. So first thing he has to do is he has to extract data from the database and then Using his XML library, he has to convert it into some XML. So once that is done, you can you know, set this XML as the response payload of the JAXRS response, and then send it back. So in addition to that, he requires something else as well. So in order to make the service up and running, he needs some sort of a web container, because uh, JAXRS once you compile the JAXRS application, you usually get a uh, web app. So you need some container, web container, to deploy this web app. So it can be anything like uh, uh, Tomcat, Jetty, JBoss, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is he needs some sort of a web container in order to run this service. Sounds complex, right? So not anymore. So thanks to Barry, now things are different. So if you look at uh, Henry's approach, He's, you know, sort of, sort of a guy who's aware of what's happening around the gold and he, around the globe, and he, you know, sort of heard about Ballerina, and he knew that, you know, this requirement nicely fit into Ballerina's capabilities. So he thought of using Ballerina, and this was his program, right? Here you can see that he has defined a service called uh, Employee Service, and here within the service you can see there's a resource. Right, this resource is constrained by get HTTP method, and you have this uh, path pair called department. 
So within the, within the resource, uh, you can see that uh, he has used some SQL client connector to talk to the database and extract data. So here you can see that uh, using the SQL client connector, he has you know, extracted data and populated the data table. And then what he has done is, using this data table, he can you know, simply convert this data table into, into some XML variable and set it as a response of the payload, set it as the payload of the response and send it to the client. So that is all he has to do. So it's pretty you know, simple. So Henry's code is not only simple, but also gets the job done quite effectively. So I'll skip this part. So in Henry's program, you know, there were key uh, constructs, such as a data table and XML. So let's you know, check uh, data table and its functionalities. So if you take data table in Ballerina, you know, as explained by us is, a data table in Ballerina you know, support tabular data structures. Data tables can be casted to struct XML or JSON, like in uh, Henry's program. And also, data tables you know, support a data stream. For instance, if you take a, a table in some SQL database, it, it could have you know, millions of records. And a, sim and a simple a select query can return like you know thousands of records. So if you like you know take all those thousands of records into a API, and if you try to you know convert it to convert it into some XML, there's a chance of you know going out of memory. But that's not the case when it's come to Ballerina, because uh, Ballerina supports data streaming. So basically, what happens is that it it maintain it maintains a cursor in the database. So as the XML data source reads data from the data source, it you know, takes the first row of the table, convert it into some XML element, and push it to the client. Then it moves on to the second row of the table, take the data, convert it into some XML, and then we'll push it to the client. So it's sort of a streaming mechanism. So there is some uh, work in progress as well. So, so instead of just you know populating data table using a SQL client connector, we also want to you know uh, data to use data tables to write data to a database. So that is actually work in progress. The idea is uh, that uh, Ballerina developer doesn't really need to know about uh, underlying implementation of. Uh, uh, underlying implementation of databases. For, for instance, it could be SQL, it could be MySQL, it could be even uh, uh, Oracle DB, it doesn't matter, because a uh, Ballerina developer is only interested in uh, uh, data table abstraction. So if you look at uh, XML, so the so first thing is, uh, no need to worry about third-party libraries. So that's like the major difference, because if you use Java, definitely you have to you know, depend on some third-party library. But when it's come to Ballerina, you don't have to do that, because Ballerina is uh, ball XML is a part of part of the type system of uh, Ballerina. It also provides a compile time validation in the sense that you don't have to wait till the runtime to figure out that your XML is not well formed. And of course, a Ballerina has its extended ver version of uh, XML specification, so I'm not going to go into those uh, details. So here, you can see that how you can you know, define an XML variable. So here you can see uh, XML literal, and here you can see the XML variable. So this is how you, you know, construct an uh, XML variable. And here you can see how you can define namespaces. So this is Ballerina's way of you know, defining namespaces. Here you can see we have defined a namespace with this URI, and its prefix is ns1. And here, in the second example, you can see that I have used this namespace within this variable. So, so let's say you haven't you know, defined this uh, namespace here. 
So in that case, if you try to say in this one, there will be a compil compilation error. So if you look at the third example, you can see that I have you know introduced an attribute, right? So so now if you want to you know access this attribute, what you have to do is uh, you have to you know do something like this. First you have to specify the variable, and then you have to use the at notation to say that you are interested in the attribute value, and then you can simply say the fully qualified name. So, so that is how you can you know, specify namespaces and XML literals, and also how you can you know, access attribute values. So the other thing is uh, you can do something like this when it comes to Ballerina. So basically what you can do is uh, you can you know, concatenate each of these uh, variables into another XML. So in Ballerina, this XML type is a sequence of items. So these uh, items can be uh, an element, it can be a text, text node, it can be a comment, it can be a processing instruction. So any, any of those things can be go into this sequence. So the main reason of having a sequence instead of having a tree is that, for instance, let's say you have a backend and your backend is sending back a response with a MIME type application XML. So in that case, let's say the backend is, chunk, the backend is sending chunk responses. So in that case, if you are you know, constructing a tree, you have to wait till you get all the chunks, because then only you can construct the tree. But if you are you know, handling, it in, handling it in a sequential way, you can you know, start processing it as soon as you get the first chunk. So that's like the main advantage of you know, uh, considering XML as a flat sequence. So secondly, XML supports uh, interpolation. So here you can see that I have defined X3 XML variable. And here you can see there are, like, there are three placeholders. So first one is a uh, First one is uh, filled with the root tag, and the second one is using the uh, title string variable here. And here you can see that I have you know, defined a, a mathematical calculation. So the point here is that when you, the, moment, the moment you access X3, these uh, placeholders will be you know, populated with the values of these variables. And here you can see that there is a mathematical expression. So this mathematical expression will get evaluated at the time you access the value of x3. This, this, doesn't this doesn't necessarily have to be a mathematical expression. It can be even a function code. Doesn't matter. All right, so lastly, I would like to talk about uh, uh, some of the functions supported by uh, Ballerina for XML data type. So there are like you know quite a few uh, functions. I don't want to go into details of these uh, functions. So these are like uh, some of the functions uh, that are available. So one is uh, you can you know select elements. You can select children if you want. If you, you can select uh, descendants. Set you can even set children. You can check if it is empty. Likewise, there are quite a few functions that are available in Ballerina. So with all these uh, functionalities and functions, we actually eliminate the need for XPath. So you know that usually when you work with XML, you have to uh, work with XPath in order to you know, navigate through the XML payload. So with Ballerina, you don't really have to do that because Ballerina itself is sufficient enough for you to you know, transform a given XML payload. All right, so back to the story. So both developers have you know, successfully uh, you know, developed their services. Now, uh, James, CEO of the Datadump company, you know, wants his developers to you know, develop another service. So this, another serv so this service is to, you know, ex ex uh, is to uh, so this service is to you know, figure out uh, which employees are elig eligible for awards for the current quarter, right? So this time, 
James uh, wants this uh, service to be mobile friendly. So when, it's, when it is mobile friendly, you know that we have to use JSON, right? So once again, let's look at each uh, developer's approach to solve this problem. So William, you know that he's a hardworking guy. So he straight away you know, went back to the whiteboard and start designing his API, right? So since he's a Java fan, so this is his uh, thinking process. Here you can see that you know, first thing he has to do is he has to decide on a JSON implementation. There are like you know, quite a few JSON implementations available. He has to figure out which one is suitable for his requirement. So, so then uh, when you decide upon a JSON library, you have to you know, check for license and everything, right? So once that is done, so, so this service will be consuming the service which we created earlier. So uh, he has to use some XML library in order to read the response from the first service and transform it into some XML representations. So once that is done, he can actually start working on his uh, business logic. So after you know, uh, completing his business logic, what he has to do is he has to seri serialize the XML payload back to some JSON payload before he sends it back to the client. So, so it sounds like a lot of work, right? But once again, Hendy chose Ballerina. He, he fell in love with Ballerina and, and for him it's just a piece of cake. So this is uh, Hendy's program. So if you look at Hendy's program, once again he has defined a service and within that service uh, he has defined a resource. So here you can see that uh, this is a new resource that ends, ends with awards, right? So within his resource you can see that he's invoking the first resource which they created. So in order to do that he's using some HTTP client connector. So this part is the, is the interesting part. So he get the response from the HTTP client connector and then you know that that, that response is going to be some XML payload, right? So what you do is you get that XML payload from the response and put it into some XML uh, variable. This, here I have named this variable as employees. So once you have extracted the XML payload, you can you know, actually start working on the business logic. So I haven't added anything here. So it can be any business logic. So let's say you have completed your business logic. So now here you can see that this XML payload is converted into some JSON payload. So, so, so this conversion happens at this place. So once you have converted this XML payload into a JSON payload, what you can do is you can you know, set this JSON payload to the response and then you know, send it back to the client. So that's all Henry has to do in order to you know, uh, create a service that produces JSON responses. So let's look at a JSON data type in Ballerina. So like I said earlier, so when it's come to JSON data type, again, you don't have to depend on any third party library. All those stuff are, you know, in built in, it's, you know, built in in Ballerina. And it uh, provides compile time validation, similar to XML. This also provides a compile time validation. And it's easy to add, remove and modify uh, JSON payloads. I'll, you know, show how to do that in a minute. So apart from that, we also have something called constraint JSON, which provides like extra validation. It's like, you know, you can associate uh, and associate any struct to a JSON. For instance, let's say you have a struct called employee, you can associate that struct to this JSON so that you can make sure that this JSON payload only contains information related to employee struct. So the other thing is JSON type is similar to maps and structs in Ballerina. So if you know how to work with maps, you know how to work with JSON. If you know how to work with struct, you know how to work with JSON. So this obviously, you know, cut down the learning curve of a Ballerina developer. So this is, you know, a small code snippet I, which I extracted from one of my programs. So here you can see I have defined 
a JSON variable called J1, and I have assigned a string value. You know that the JSON can be a string value, it can be a double value, it can be a Boolean value, it can be a null value. Uh, JSON, it could even be a, a simple JSON object, or it could even be a JSON array. So, so this uh, JSON variable can have any of these things. That's why we call it as a union type uh, uh, data type. So that's something interesting here. So if you take this JSON variable, here you can see this key value pair. So price is the key and the value is this one. So here again I have used uh, a mathematical expression. So this mathematical expression will get executed when you, you know, s start accessing values of J1. So in this case, uh, this doesn't have to be just a mathematical expression. Just as in XML, it can be a function call. It can even be another JSON variable. So let's look at how you can, you know, navigate through a JSON payload. So in this case, uh, I have, you know, created a JSON a variable called person. So this person JSON variable have like a if name and the last first name and the last name of this person, and also it contains some uh, family details. So let's see how you can, you know, navigate through this uh, JSON uh, payload. So let's say I just want to modify the value of this of this. So in this case, uh, what you have to do is uh, you can say person dot family, which would let you to access this uh, JSON array. And then you can say that I want to access the first index. And then uh, you can set the value. So it also supports uh, uh, access, accessing values like this. So if you want to you know, access the value of this, what you have to do is you can say person. And then you can. Uh, Within a square brackets, you can give the name, and then if you want, you can update the value. So apart from that, let's say uh, instead of a first name and last name, let's say you just want to add uh, add middle name. So if you want to do something like that, so what you have to do is you can say person and whatever the key value you key value you want, and then here you can provide the actual value of this key. So it's quite. Uh, simple, and you don't have to really worry about a, a JSON path in order to, you know, transform JSON payloads. So, who's, so who's the smarter developer at the end? So, obviously, it's going to be Henry because uh, Henry, our Ballerina developer, can focus on the extract. Uh, requirement, so he doesn't have to bother about, you know, third-party libraries, uh, JAXRS implementations, uh, license, he doesn't have to bo bother about any of those. So he can, you know, directly, you know, st start working on his uh, business requirement because everything he needs is, he needs is there in Ballerina. So it's actually uh, saves time, time and effort, so uh, because Ballerina itself has this inbuilt functionality, so it saves times and effort, time and effort, and ultimately saves money. So, which is, you know, which is uh, James interested in. So, apart from that, he can write uh, simple and readable codes, which is uh, sort of important because your API may be there for like five to ten years. So. So if your API is there for like five to 10 years, the original author of the API will not be there. So it's important that your code is uh, readable, therefore it's uh, maintainable. So, so that's about uh, XML, JSON, and SQL data types. So do you guys have any questions? Yep. So, like a default namespace. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, how, uh, will so, 
So you can define, so let's say you have an XML element which does not have a namespace. So in that case, the default namespace would be the uh, package name of that program. So, and also you can define your own default namespace. So if I go back to my example here, So here I have defined a namespace, right? This namespace has a prefix. So let's say you don't have this part. That would be your default namespace. Uh, so I actually defined only XML and S with the namespace name without the label in the end? Yes, without this part. Okay. So that would be your default namespace. So, so, so let's say, uh, so let's say you have defined some XML literal, which doesn't have a namespace. So in that case, it would be automatically becomes your default namespace. Yep. So at the moment, uh, we don't really, you know, have uh, support for XSLT. But uh, all the transformations that is done using XSLT can be done using Barry itself. You don't have to use any XSLT script to transform your payload because Barry itself provide adequate functionalities to you know transform your XML payload. Could be. Yeah, at the moment uh, we don't have XSLT. Of course, uh, so, you know, our idea is uh, like, you know, make Balvina powerful enough to, you know, transform XML payloads. So, of course, uh, if it is, uh, you know, coming short of uh, transforming XML payloads, we would certainly can think about it. Or, or so uh, uh, at the moment uh, we don't have support for JSON schemas, but we actually you know planning to support that. So uh, at the moment, what you can do is you can use a struct as I just explained. So it's going to be a long struct. Flat JSON. Yeah, flat JSON in the sense. You can have your nested uh, JSON as well because within the struct you can define another struct. Oh, okay. So it can be a nested one. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay, maybe. May you, you showed us how to transform uh, XML to JSON very quickly. However, according to my experience, there are always some perks like uh, transforming values to ge guess if it's number or, or something or, or array. So does it respect the JSON schema or can I enforce the XML element to be saying, okay, this is really a number, not a string, or this is an array even having one element? All right, so, so if you go back here, Yes, that's all. all right. So here you can see that I, I'm transforming this XML payload into a, into a JSON, JSON payload, right? So here you can pass options. You know, here you can say if it is a XML array, you can say that uh, wrap this uh, XML uh, uh, XML array with some uh, special key value pair. So. But uh, answer to your second question, at the moment we don't really support uh, providing schemas like that. So that is something you know we have to work on. But when it's come to arrays, uh, what happens is that uh, you can specify a wrapper element which would wrap the XML array into some JSON uh, object. Yep. Single element on 
Yeah. Yeah, that's like a common problem, right? So that's like the most form fa famous problem I have seen in ESB integration. So, so what basically happens is that let's say you have a single element uh, XML payload, and you want that to be an array, right? So in that case, uh, here under options, I haven't showed you. Showed you under options, uh, you can uh, specify that. You can specify that this this is this needs to be an array. In the sense, what, uh, what command or what option should be put there in order to make it uh, as a single array? Uh, that is there in uh, examples. Uh, I can certainly show you guys. Show you after the uh, talk. Okay. Any questions? Can we define common libraries? To common libraries to reuse. Uh, what sort of libraries in there? So, object in the sense, uh, what sort of objects? Without common functions. So you are talking about reusability of uh, common logic. Yes. Right? So if that is the case, uh, you can define bare enough functions and use those functions to you know, reuse your code. Across different services. Yeah, across different services. Any other questions? All right, then, thank you very much. <laughs>